Dracula by Bram Stoker. Επιμέλεια Γιώργος Πιτροπογιανάκης My Journal by Jonathan Harker 3rd of May, Bistritz Left Munich at 8.35pm on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse which I got of it from the train, and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station as we had arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east. The most western of splendid bridges over the Danube, which is here of noble width and depth, took us among the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time and came after nightfall to Klausenberg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royal. I had for dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up some way with red pepper, which was very good, but thirsty. Memo. Get recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called paprika hendel, and that, as it was a national dish, I should be able to get it anywhere along the Carpathians. I found my smattering of German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having some time at my disposal, when in London, I had visited the British Museum and made search among the books and the maps of the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance in dealing with the noble of the country. I find that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the border of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia and Bukovina, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on any map or work giving the exact locality of Castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own Ordnance Survey maps. But I found that Bistritz, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. In the population of Transylvania there are four distinct nationalities, Saxons in the south, and mixed with them the Valachs, who are the descendants of the Dacians, Magyars in the west, and Zekels in the east and north. I am going among the latter, who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in it. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians as if it were the center of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Memo, I must ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my carafe and was still thirsty. Towards morning I slept, and was wakened by the continuous knocking at my door, so I guess I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika, and a sort of porridge of maize flour, which they said was mamaliga, and an eggplant stuffed with force meat, a very excellent dish, which they call impletata. Memo, get recipe for this also. I had to hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before eight. Or rather, it ought to have done so, for after rushing to the station at 7.30, I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before it began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought they to be in China? All day long, we seemed to dwaddle through a country which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on the top of steep hills, such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, which seemed, from the wide stony margin on each side of them, to be the subject of great floods. It takes a lot of water and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like peasants at home, or those I saw coming through France and Germany, with short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers. But others were very picturesque. 
The women looked pretty, except when you got near them, but they were all very clumsy about the waist. They had all full white sleeves of some kind or other, and most of them had big belts with a lot of strips of something fluttering from them like the dresses in a ballet, but of course petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were the Slovaks, who are more barbarian than the rest, with their big cowboy hats, great baggy dirty white trousers, white linen shirts, and enormous heavy leather belts, nearly a foot wide, all studded over with brass nails. They wore high boots with their trousers tucked into them and had long black hair and heavy black moustaches. They are very picturesque, but do not look prepossessing. On the stage they would be set down at once as some old oriental band of brigands. They are, however, I am told, very harmless and rather wanting in natural self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place. Being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads from it into Bukovina, it has had a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks, and lost 13,000 people, the casualties of war proper being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found to my delight to be thoroughly old-fashioned, for of course I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress, white undergarment with long double apron, front and back, of coloured stuff fitting almost too tight for modesty. When I came close she bowed and said, the Herr Englishman? Yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white shirt sleeves who had followed her to the door. He went but immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow the diligence will start for Bukovina. A place on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass my carriage will await you and will bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. May the 4th. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me. But on making inquiries as to details he seemed somewhat reticent and pretended he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly. At least he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who had received me, looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter, and that was all he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula, and could tell me anything of the castle, both he and his wife crossed themselves, and saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refused to speak further. It was so near the time of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else, for it was all very mysterious, and not by any means comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came to my room and said in a very hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip of what German she knew, and mixed it all up with some other language which I did not know at all. I was just able to follow her by asking many questions. When I told her that I must go at once, and that I was engaged on important business, she asked again, Do you know what day it is? I answered that it was the 4th of May. She shook her head as she said again, Yes, I know that, I know that. But do you know what day it is? On my saying that I did not understand, she went on, It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you not know where you are going? And what you are going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally she went down on her knees and implored me not to go, 
at least to wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could allow nothing to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up, and said as gravely as I could that I thanked her, but my duty was imperative, and that I must go. She then rose, dried her eyes, and taking a crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. I did not know what to do, for as an English churchman I had been taught to regard such things as in some measure idolatrous, and yet it seemed so ungracious to refuse an old lady meaning so well and in such a state of mind. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put the rosary round my neck and said, For your mother's sake, and went out of the room. I am writing up this part of the diary whilst I am waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still round my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear, I do not know, but I am not feeling nearly as easy in my mind as usual. If this book should ever reach Mina before I do, let it bring my goodbye. Here comes the coach. May the 5th, the castle. The grey of the morning has passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jagged, whether with trees or hills I know not, for it is so far off that big things and little are mixed. I am not sleepy, and as I am not to be called till I awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. There are many odd things to put down, and lest who reads them may fancy that I dine too well before I left the streets, let me put down my dinner exactly. I dined on what they call robber steak, bits of bacon, onion and beef, seasoned with red pepper, and strung on sticks and roasted over the fire in the simple style of the London's cat's meat. The wine was golden mediash, which produces a queer sting on the tongue, which is, however, not disagreeable. I only had a couple of glasses of this, and nothing else. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat, and I saw him talking with the landlady. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me, and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they call by a name meaning word-bearer, came and listened, and then looked at me, most of them pityingly. I could hear a lot of words often repeated, queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd. So I quietly got my polyglot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say, they were not cheering to me, for amongst them were Ordog, Satan, Poco, Hell, Sregoka, Witch, Vrolok, and Voslak, both of which meant the same thing one being Slovak and the other Serbian for something that is either werewolf or vampire. Memo. I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the inn door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but on learning that I was English, he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting from an unknown place to meet an unknown man. But everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn-yard and its crowd of picturesque figures, all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway, with its background of rich foliage, of oleander and orange trees in green tubs, clustered in the centre of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole front of the box seat, a gotza they call them, cracked his big whip over the four small horses which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears in the beauty of the scene as we drove along, although had I known the language, or rather languages which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might have not been able to throw them off quite so easily. Before us lay a green sloping land full of forests and woods, with here and there steep hills crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses, the blank gable end to the road. 
There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom. Apple, plum, pear, cherry. And as we drove by, I could see the green grass under the trees spangled with the fallen petals. In and out amongst these green hills, of what they call here the middle land, ran the road, losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve, or was shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods, which here and there ran down the hillside like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but still we seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. I could not understand what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Borgo Prun. I was told that this road is in summertime excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect, it is different from the general run of roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not to be kept in too good order. Of old, the Hospaders would not repair them, lest the Turks should think they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war, which was always really at loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the middle land rose mighty slopes of forest up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling upon them and bringing out all the glorious colours of this beautiful range, deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags, till these were themselves lost in the distance where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which, as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill, and opened up the lofty snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look, Eastern Zek, God's seat. As we wound on our endless way, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to creep round us. This was emphasised by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset, and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed that goiter was painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn round as we approached, but seemed in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me. For instance, hayricks in the trees, and here and there very beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a litre wagon, the ordinary peasant's cart with its long snake-like vertebra, calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this were sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their white and the Slovaks with their coloured sheepskins, the latter carrying lance fashion their long staves with axe at end. As the evening fell, it began to get very cold, and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness the gloom of the trees, oak, beech and pine. Though in the valleys, which ran deep between the spurs of the hills as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes, as the road was cut through the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us, great masses of greyness, which here and there bestrewed the trees, produced a peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies engendered earlier in the evening when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds, which among the Carpathians seemed to wind ceaselessly through the valleys. Sometimes the hills were so steep that despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up to them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said, you must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce. And then he added, with what he evidently meant for grim pleasantry, for he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest. And you may have enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was for a moment's pause to light the lamps. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers, and they kept speaking to him one after the other as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully with his long whip and with wild cries of encouragement urged them on to further exertions. 
Then, through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed in a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side and to frown down upon us. We were entering the Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with earnestness which would take no denial. These were certainly of an odd and varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith, with a kindly word and a blessing, and that strange mixture of fear-meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel of Bistritz, the sign of the cross, the guard against the evil eye. Then, as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers, craning over the edge of the coach, peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected, but though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. This state of excitement kept on for some little time, and at last we saw before us the pass opening out on the eastern side. There were dark rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had two separate atmospheres, and that now we had got into the thunderous one. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of the lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could now see the sandy road lying white before us, but there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sign of gladness which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking what I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something which I could hardly hear, it was spoken so quietly and in so low a tone. I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then, turning to me, he said in German, worse than my own, there is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovina and return tomorrow or the next day. Better the next day. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly, so the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants, and a universal crossing of themselves, a calèche with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us, and drew up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps as the rays fell on them that the horses were coal-black and splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat, which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lamplight as he turned to us. He said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend. The man stammered in reply, The English hare was in a hurry. To which the stranger replied, That is why I suppose you wish him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift. As he spoke, he smiled. The lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth, as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another the line from Berger's Lenore, For the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away, at the same time putting out two fingers and crossing himself. Give me the hare's luggage, said the driver, and with exceeding alacrity my bags were handed out and put in the caleche. Then I descended from the side of the coach, as the caleche was close alongside, the driver helping me, helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word he shook his reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. As I looked back, I saw the steam from the horses of the coach by the light of the lamps, and projected against it the figures of my late companions crossing themselves. 
then the driver cracked his whip, called to his horses, and off they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill, and a lonely feeling came over me. But a cloak was thrown over my shoulders and a rug across my knees, and the driver said in excellent German, The night is chill, mein Herr, and my master the Count bade me take all care of you. There is a flask of Slivovitz, the plum brandy of the country, underneath the seat, if you should require it. I did not take any, but it was a comfort to know it was there all the same. I felt a little strange, and not a little frightened. I think had there been any alternative, I should have taken it, instead of prosecuting that unknown night journey. The carriage went at a hard pace straight along, and then we made a complete turn, and went along another straight road. It seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again and so I took note of some salient point, and found that this was so. I would have liked to have asked the driver what this all meant, but I really feared to do so, for I thought that placed as I was, any protest would have no effect in case there had been an intention to delay. By and by, however, as I was curious to know how time was passing, I struck a match, and by its flame looked at my watch. It was within a few minutes of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock, for I suppose the general supposition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long, agonized wailing, as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, till borne on the wind, which now sighed softly through the pass, a wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country, as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. At the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear, but the driver spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down, but shivered and sweated, as though after runaway from sudden fright. Then, far off in the distance, from the mountains on each side of us began a louder and sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected the horses and myself in the same way, for I was minded to jump up from the calèche and run, whilst they reared again and plunged madly, so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound, and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and to stand before them. He petted and soothed them, and whispered something in their ears, as I have heard of horse tamers doing, and with extraordinary effect, for under his caresses they became quite manageable again, though they still trembled. The driver again took his seat, and shaking his reins, started off at a great pace. This time, after going to the far side of the pass, he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway which ran sharply to the right. Soon, we were hemmed in with trees, which in places arched right over the roadway till we passed as through a tunnel, and again great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in shelter, we could hear the rising wind, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, though this grew fainter as we went on our way. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing round on us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, and the horses shared my fear. But the driver was not in the least disturbed. He kept turning his head to left and right, but I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He at once checked the horses, and jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do, the less as the howling of the wolves grew closer. But while I wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again, and without a word took his seat, and we resumed our journey. 
I think I must have fallen asleep, and kept dreaming of the incident, for it seemed to be repeated endlessly, and now, looking back, it is like a sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near the road that even in the darkness around us I could watch the driver's motions. He went rapidly to where the blue flame rose. It must have been very faint, for it did not seem to illumine the place around it at all, and gathering a few stones, formed them into some device. Once there appeared a strange optical effect. When he stood between me and the flame, he did not obstruct it, for I could still see its ghostly flicker all the same. This startled me, but as the effect was only momentary, I took it that my eyes deceived me, straining through the darkness. Then, for a time, there were no blue flames, and we sped onward through the gloom with the howling of the wolves around us, as though they were following in a moving circle. At last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had yet done, and during his absence the horses began to tremble worse than ever, and to snort and scream with fright. I could not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether. But just then the moon, sailing through the black clouds, appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling pine-clad rock, and by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves with white teeth, lolling red tongues, with long sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them than even when they howled. For myself, I felt a sort of paralysis of fear. It is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true import. All at once the wolves began to howl, as though the moonlight had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared, and looked helplessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see. But the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had perforce to remain within it. I called to the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to break out through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the caleche, hoping by the noise to scare the wolves from the side, so as to give him a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there, I know not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound, saw him stand in the roadway. As he swept his long arms, as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle, the wolves fell back and back further still. Just then a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon, so that we were again in darkness. When I could see again, the driver was climbing into the caleche, and the wolves had disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept on our way, now in almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon. We kept on ascending, with occasional periods of quick descent, but in the main always ascending. Suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the moon. May the 5th. I must have been asleep, for certainly if I had been fully awake I must have noticed the approach to such a remarkable place. In the gloom the courtyard looked of considerable size, and as several dark ways led from it, under great round arches, it perhaps seemed bigger than it really is. I have not yet been able to see it by daylight. When the caleche stopped, the driver jumped down, and held out his hand to assist me to alight. Again I could not but notice his prodigious strength. His hand actually seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if he had chosen. Then he took out my traps and placed them on the ground beside me as I stood close to a great door, old and studded with large iron nails, and set in a projecting doorway of massive stone. I could see, even in the dim light, that the stone was massively carved, but that the carving had been much worn by time and weather. As I stood, the driver jumped again into the seat and shook the reins. The horses started forward, and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. 
I stood in silence where I was, for I did not know what to do. Of bell or knocker there was no sign. Through these frowning walls and dark window openings it was not likely that my voice could penetrate. The time I waited seemed endless, and I felt doubts and fears crowding upon me. What sort of place had I come to, and among what kind of people? What sort of grim adventure was it on which I had embarked? Was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor's clerk sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner? Solicitor's clerk. Mina would not like that. Solicitor, for just before leaving London I got word that my examination was successful, and I am now a full-blown solicitor. I began to rub my eyes and pinch myself to see if I were awake. It all seemed like a horrible nightmare to me, and I expected I should suddenly awake and find myself at home with the dawn struggling in through the windows, as I had now and again felt in the morning after a day of overwork but my flesh answered the pinching test, and my eyes were not to be deceived. I was indeed awake, and among the Carpathians. All I could do now was to be patient, and to wait the coming of the morning. Just as I had come to this conclusion, I heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door, and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. Then there was the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back. A key was turned with the loud grating noise of long disuse, and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean-shaven, save for a long white moustache, and clad in black from head to foot, without a single speck of colour about him anywhere. He held in his hand an antique silver lamp, in which the flame burned without chimney or globe of any kind, throwing long, quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door. The old man motioned me in with his right hand with a courtly gesture, saying in excellent English, but with a strange intonation, Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. He made no motion of stepping to meet me, but stood like a statue, as though his gesture of welcome had fixed him into stone. The instant, however, that I stepped over the threshold, he moved impulsively forward, and holding out his hand, grasped mine with a strength which made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice, more like the hand of a dead than a living man. Again, he said, Welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not seen, that for a moment I doubted if it were not the same person to whom I was speaking. So to make sure, I said, interrogatively, Count Dracula, he bowed in a courtly way as he replied, I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome Mr. Harker to my house. Come in. The night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. As he was speaking, he put the lamp on a bracket on the wall, and stepping out, took my luggage. He had carried it in before I could forestall him. I protested, but he insisted. Nay, sir, you are my guest. It is late, and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage, then up a great winding stair, and along another great passage, on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this he threw open a heavy door, and I rejoiced to see within a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs flamed and flared. The Count halted, putting down my bags, closed the door, and crossing the room, opened another door, which led into a small octagonal room lit by a single lamp, and seemingly without a window of any sort. Passing through this, he opened another door, and motioned me to enter. 
it was a welcome sight. For here was a great bedroom, well lighted and warmed, with another log fire, which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney. The Count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew, saying before he closed the door, You will need, after your journey, to refresh yourself by making your toilet. I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come into the other room, where you will find your supper prepared. The light and warmth and the Count's courteous welcome seemed to have dissipated all my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered I was half famished with hunger. So making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room. I found supper already laid out. My host, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against the stonework, made a graceful wave of his hand to the table and said, I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already, and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me to read. One passage of it, at least, gave me a thrill of pleasure. I much regret that an attack of gout, from which malady I am a constant sufferer, forbids absolutely any travelling on my part for some time to come. But I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute, one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man, full of energy and talent in his own way, and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent, and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend on you when you will during his stay, and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of a dish, and I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. This, with some cheese and a salad and a bottle of old toquet, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating it, the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time I had finished my supper, and by my host's desire had drawn up a chair by the fire and begun to smoke a cigar which he offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I had now an opportunity of observing him, and I found him of a very marked physiognomy. His face was a strong, a very strong aquiline, with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils. With lofty domed forehead, and hair growing scantily round the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale and at the tops extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm, though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto I had noticed the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine. But seeing them now close to me, I could not but notice that they were rather coarse broad with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the centre of the palm. The nails were long and fine, and cut to a sharp point. As the Count leaned over me, and his hands touched me, I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back, and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent for a while, and as I looked towards the window I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed a strange stillness over everything, but as I listened I heard, as if from down below in the valley, the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, 
listen to them. The children of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon. So sleep well, and dream well. And with a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room, and I entered the bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear, I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. May the 7th. It is again early morning, but I have rested and enjoyed the last 24 hours. I slept till late in the day and awoke of my own accord. When I had dressed myself, I went into the room where we had supped and found a cold breakfast laid out, with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the hearth. There was a card on the table on which was written, I have to be absent for a while, do not wait for me, D. So I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell, so that I might let the servants know I had finished. But I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are round me. The table service is of gold, and so beautifully wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics, and must have been of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but these were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But still, in none of the rooms is there a mirror. There is not even a toilet glass on my table, and I've had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen a servant anywhere, or heard a sound near the castle except for the howling of the wolves. When I had finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it breakfast or dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock when I had it, I looked about for something to read, for I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper, or even writing materials. So I opened another door in the room and found a sort of library. The door opposite mine I tried, but found it locked. In the library I found to my great delight a vast number of English books, whole shelves full of them, and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers. A table in the centre was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. The books were of the most varied kind. History, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Army and Navy Lists, and, it somehow gladdened my heart to see it, the Law List. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way, and hoped that I had had a good night's rest. Then he went on. I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These friends, and he laid his hand on some of the books, have been good friends to me, and for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Through them I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But, alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books. 
To you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. But count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate. But yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that did I move and speak in your London, none there are who would not know me for a stranger. That is not enough for me. Here I am noble. I am boyard. The common people know me, and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not, and to know not is to care not for. I am content if I am like the rest, so that no man stops me if he sees me, or pause in his speaking if he hear my words to say, Aha, a stranger. I have been so long master that I would be master still, or at least that none other should be master of me. You come to me not alone as agent of my friend Peter Hawkins of Exeter, to tell me all about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest here a while with me, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation. And I would that you tell me when I make error, even of the smallest, in my speaking. I am sorry that I had to be away so long today, but you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important affairs in hand. Of course, I said all I could about being willing and asked if I might come into the room when I chose. He answered, Yes, certainly, and added, You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. There is reason that all things are as they are, and did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I said I was sure of this, and then he went on. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things may be here. This led to much conversation and, as it was evident that he wanted to talk, if only for talking's sake, I asked him many questions regarding things that had already happened to me, or come within my notice. Sometimes he sheared off the subject, or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand, but generally he answered all I asked most frankly. Then, as time went on, I had got somewhat bolder. I asked him some of the strange things of the preceding night, as, for instance, why the coachman went to the places where we had seen the blue flames. Was it indeed true that they showed where gold was hidden? He then explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night, in fact, when all evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway, a blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been hidden he went on, in the region through which you came last night, there can be but little doubt. For it was the ground fought over for centuries by the Valachian, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a foot of soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots, or invaders. In old days there were stirring times, when the Austrian and the Hungarians came up in hordes and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women, the aged and the children too, and waited their coming on the rocks above the passes, that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant, he found but little, for whatever there had been was sheltered in the friendly soil. But how, said I, can it have remained so long undiscovered 
when there is a sure index to it, if men will but take the trouble to look. The Count smiled, and as his lips ran back over his gums, the long, sharp canine teeth showed out strangely. He answered, Because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And, dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Why, even the peasant that you tell me of, who marked the place of the flame, would not know where to look in daylight, even for his own work. You would not, I dare be sworn, be able to find these places again. There you are right, I said. I know no more than the dead where even to look for them. Then we drifted into other matters. Come, he said at last, tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order, I heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room, and as I passed through, noticed that the table had been cleared and the lamp lit, for it was by this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa, reading of all things in the world, an English Bradshaw's guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into the plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything, and asked me a myriad questions about the place and its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighbourhood, for he evidently, at the end, knew very much more than I did. When I remarked this, he answered, Well, but my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there, I shall be all alone. And my friend, Harker Jonathan, nay, pardon me, I fall into my country's habit of putting your patronymic first. My friend, Jonathan Harker, will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be in Exeter, miles away, probably working at Papers of the Law with my other friend, Peter Hawkins. We went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Perfleet. When I had told him the facts, and got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a letter with them, ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place. I read to him the notes which I had made at the time, and which I inscribe here. At Perfleet, on a by-road, I came across just such a place as seemed to be required and where was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It is surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure, built of heavy stones, and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates were of heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, no doubt a corruption of the old Quatrefas, as the house is four-sided, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains in all some twenty acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall above mentioned. There are many trees on it, which make it in places gloomy, and there is a deep, dark-looking pond or small lake, evidently fed by some springs, as the water is clear and flows away in a fair-sized stream. The house is very large, and of all periods back, I should say, to medieval times, for one part of the stone is immensely thick, with only a few windows high up, and heavily barred with iron. It looks like part of a keep, and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, as I had not the key of the door leading to it from the house, but I have taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house has been added to, but in a very straggling way, and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are but few houses close at hand, one being a very large house, only recently added to, and formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day, and after all, how few days go to make up a century. 
I rejoice that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety nor mirth, nor the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters which please the young and gay. I am no longer young, and my heart, through weary years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken, the shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow, and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. Somehow his words and his looks did not seem to accord, or else it was that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine. Presently, with an excuse, he left me, asking me to put all my papers together. He was some little time away, and I began to look at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, which I found open naturally at England, as if that map had been much used. On looking at it, I found in certain places little rings marked, and on examining these I noticed that one was near London on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated, and the other two were Exeter and Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. It was the better part of an hour when the Count returned. Ah, he said, still at your books. Good. But you must not work always. Come, I am informed that your supper is ready. He took my arm, and we went into the next room, where I found an excellent supper ready on the table. The Count again excused himself, as he had dined out on his being away from home. But he sat as on the previous night, and chatted whilst I ate. After supper I smoked as on the last evening, and the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt that it was getting very late indeed, but I did not say anything, for I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. I was not sleepy, as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing that chill which comes over one at the coming of dawn, which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who are near death die generally at the change to the dawn, or at the turn of the tide. Anyone who has, when tired, and tied as it were to his post, experienced this change in the atmosphere, can well believe it. All at once we heard the crow of a cock coming up with preternatural shrillness through the clear morning air. Count Dracula, jumping to his feet, said, Why, there is the morning again. How remiss I am to let you stay up so long. You must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of England less interesting, so that I may not forget how time flies by us. And with a courtly bow he left me. I went into my own room and drew the curtains, but there was little to notice. The window opened into the courtyard. All I could see was the warm grey quickening sky. So I pulled the curtains again and have written of this day. May the 8th I began to fear as I wrote in this book that I was getting too diffuse. But now I am glad that I went into detail from the first for there is something so strange about this place, and all in it, that I cannot but feel uneasy. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving glass by the window, and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder, and heard the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice this at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time there could be no error, for the man was close to me and I could see him over my shoulder. But there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it, except myself. This was startling, and coming on top of so many strange things, 
was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness which I always have when the Count is near. But at that instant I saw that the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demoniac fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then, seizing the shaving glass, he went on, and this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it. And opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the grass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless in my watch case, or the bottom of the shaving pot, which is fortunately of metal. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared, but I could not find the Count anywhere, so I breakfasted alone. It is strange that as yet I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast I did a little exploring in the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. But I am not in heart to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place save from the windows in the castle walls is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other things. When I look back, after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing I am certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it. He would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits. And if the latter be so, I need and shall need all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these menial offices, surely it is proof that there is no one else to do them. 
This gave me a terrible fright, for if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did, by only holding up his hand in silence? How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing which I have been taught to regard with disfavour and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help, is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself? Or that it is a medium, a tangible help in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort? Sometime, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight he may talk of himself, if I turn the conversation that way, I must be very careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvanian history, and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. This he explained afterwards by saying that to a boyar, the pride of his house and name is his own pride, that their glory is his glory, that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, he always said we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it, for to me it was most fascinating. It seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke, and walked about the room, pulling his great white moustache, and grasping anything on which he laid his hands, as though he would crush it by main strength. One thing he said, which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We Zekels have a right to be proud, he said, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races, who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ulgric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, I and of Asia and Africa too, till the peoples thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame till the dying peoples held that in their veins ran the blood of those old witches who expelled from Scythia had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools, what devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race? that we were proud, that when the Magyar, the Lombard, the Abar, the Bulgar, or the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back? Is it strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, that the Honfongalas was completed there, and when the Hungarian flood swept eastwards, the Zekils were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and to us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land. I, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard, for, as the Turk says, water sleeps, and enemy is sleepless. Who more gladly than we, throughout the four nations, received the bloody sword? or at its warlike call, flocked quicker to the standard of the king. When was redeemed that great shame of my nation, the shame of Cassava, when the flags of the Valak and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent? Who was it but one of my own race, who, as Vovoide, crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed. 
who was it that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk, and brought the shame of slavery on them? Was it not this Dracula indeed, who inspired that other of his race, who in a later age, again and again, brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land? Who, when he was beaten back, came again and again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field, where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph? They said he thought only of himself. Bah! What good are peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without a brain and heart to conduct it? Again, when after the Battle of Mohacs we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were among their leaders, for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Zekels and the Dracula as their heart's blood, their brains and their swords can boast a record that mushroom growths like the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace. And the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. Memo. This diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at cockcrow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. May the 12th. Let me begin with facts. Bare, meagre facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have to rest on my own observation or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books, and simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examined in at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge may somehow or some time be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that a change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand, and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say, to banking, and another to look after shipping, in case local help were needed in a place far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked him to explain more fully, so that I might not by any chance mislead him. I shall illustrate, he said. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now, here let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange that I have sought the services of one so far from London, instead of some resident there, that my motive was that no local interest might be served, save my wish only and as one of London resident might perhaps have some purpose of himself or friend to serve, I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labours should be only to my interest. Now, suppose I, who have much of affairs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle, or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover. Might it not be that it could with more ease be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency one for the other, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself. Is it not so? Of course, I replied and such is often done by men of business who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known to any one person. Good, he said, 
and then went on to ask about the means of making consignments and the forms to be gone through, and all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to our friend Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered I had not, and that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then write now, my young friend he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder. Write to our friend, and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much. Nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf. It was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is it not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner and that if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discuss of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them, is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of notepaper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign post, and looking at them, then looking at him, and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood, as well as if he had spoken, that I should be careful what I wrote, for that he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand, which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet, reading a book whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring, as he wrote, to some books on the table. Then he took up my two, placed them with his own, and put them by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances I felt that I should protect myself in every way that I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number 7, the Crescent, Whitby. Another to Herr Lutner, Varna. The third was to Coots and Company, London. And the fourth to Heron Klopstock and Bilroyth. Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the handle move and sank back in my seat, having just had time to replace the letters as they'd been and to resume my book before the Count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table, stamped them carefully, then turning to me said, I trust you will forgive me but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. At the door he turned, and after a moment's pause said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend, nay, let me warn you with all seriousness, that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old, and has many memories, and there are bad dreams, 
for those who sleep unwisely? Be warned. Should sleep now or ever overcome you, or like to do so, then haste to your own chamber or to these rooms, for your rest will then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then... He finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite understand. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing round me. Later, I endorse the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, I went to my room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out again and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though it was, as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison, and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my nerve. I start at my own shadow, and am full of all sorts of horrible imaginings. God knows that there is ground for any terrible fear in this accursed place. I looked out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in soft yellow moonlight, till it was almost as light as day. In the soft light the distant hills became melted, and the shadows in the valleys and gorges of velvety blackness. The mere beauty seemed to cheer me. There was peace and comfort in every breath I drew. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, and somewhat to my left, where I imagined from the lie of the rooms that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mullioned, and though weather-worn, still complete, but it was evidently many a day since the case had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hands, which I had had so many opportunities of studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner but my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss, face down, with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow. But I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years, and by thus using every projection and inequality, move downwards with considerable speed, just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? Or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of a man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. May the 15th. Once more have I seen the Count go out in this lizard fashion. He moved downwards in a sidelong way, some hundred feet down, and a good deal to the left. He vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared, I leaned out to try and see more, but without avail, the distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now, 
and thought to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared do as yet. I went back to the room and taking a lamp tried all the doors. They were all locked as I had expected and the locks were comparatively new. But I went down the stone stairs to the hall where I had entered originally. I found I could pull back the bolts easily enough and unhook the great chains. But the door was locked and the key was gone. That key must be in the Count's room. I must watch should his door be unlocked so that I may get it and escape. I went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages and to try the doors that opened from them. One or two small rooms near the hall were open but there was nothing to see in them except old furniture dusty with age and moth-eaten. At last, however, I found one door at the top of the stairway which though it seemed to be locked gave a little under pressure. I tried it harder and found it was not really locked but that the resistance came from the fact that the hinges had fallen somewhat and the heavy door rested on the floor. Here was an opportunity which I might not have again. So I exerted myself and with many efforts forced it back so that I could enter. I was now in a wing of the castle further to the right than the rooms I knew and a story lower down. From the windows I could see that the suite of rooms lay along to the south of the castle, the windows of the end room looking out both west and south. On the latter side, as well as on the former, there was a great precipice. The castle was built on the corner of a great rock, so that on three sides it was quite impregnable, and great windows were placed here where sling or bow or culverin could not reach, and consequently light and comfort, impossible to a position which had to be guarded, were secured. To the west was a great valley, then, rising far away, great jagged mountain fastnesses, rising peak on peak, the sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn, whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and crannies of the stone. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied in bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comfort than any I had seen. The windows were curtainless, and the yellow moonlight, flooding in through the diamond panes, enabled one to see even colours, whilst it softened the wealth of dust which lay over all, and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place, which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still, it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come to hate from the presence of the Count and after trying a little to school my nerves, I found a soft quietude come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen, with much thought and many blushes, her ill-spelt love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand all that has happened since I closed it last. It is nineteenth century up to date with a vengeance. And yet, unless my senses deceive me, the old centuries had, and have, powers of their own which mere modernity cannot kill. Later, the morning of May the 16th. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. Whilst I live on here, there is but one thing to hope for, that I may not go mad, if indeed I be not mad already. If I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think that of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place, the Count is the least dreadful to me. That to him alone I can look for safety, even though this be only whilst I can serve his purpose. Great God, merciful God, let me be calm for out of that way lies madness indeed. I begin to get new lights on certain things which have puzzled me. Up to now I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he made Hamlet say, My tablets, quick, my tablets, tis meet that I put it down, etc. For now, feeling as though my own brain was unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end in its undoing, 
I turn to my diary for repose. The habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warning frightened me at the time. It frightens me more now when I think of it, for in future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear to doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary, and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleepy. The Count's warning came into my mind, but I took a pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I determined not to return tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here, where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk away in the midst of the remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner, so that as I lay I could look at the lovely view to the east and the south, and, unthinking of and uncaring of for the dust, compose myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so, but I fear for all that followed was startlingly real. So real that now, sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, unchanged in any way since I came into it. I could see along the floor, in the brilliant moonlight, my own footsteps marked where I had disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time I must be dreaming when I saw them, for though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time and then whispered together. Two were dark, and had high aquiline noses like the Count's, and great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great wavy masses of golden hair, and eyes like pale sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face, and to know it in connection with some dreamy fear but I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain, but it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all of them laughed, such a silvery musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound could never have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable, tingling sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, Go on, you are first, and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, fairly gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness, which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips 
like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. Then she paused, and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips, and could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin of my throat began to tingle, as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer. Nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the supersensitive skin of my throat, and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman, and with the giant's power draw it back. The blue eyes transform with fury, the white teeth champing with rage, and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count. Never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even in the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hellfire blazed behind them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were hard like drawn wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white-hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him, and then motioned to the others as though he were beating them back. It was the same imperious gesture that I had seen used to the wolves. In a voice which, though low and almost a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring round the room, he exclaimed, How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him, or you'll have me to deal with. The fair girl, with a laugh of ribald coquetry, turned to answer him. You yourself never loved. You never love. On this the other women joined, and such a mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then the Count turned after looking at my face attentively, and he said in a soft whisper, Yes, I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, go. I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight? said one of them with a low laugh, as she pointed to the bag which she had thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there was something living within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round, whilst I was aghast with horror. But as I looked, they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them, and they could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight, and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment, before they then entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down unconscious. 
I awoke in my own bed. If it be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which is not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it the last thing before going to bed, and there were many other such details. But these things are no proof, for there may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and from some cause or other I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof. Of one thing I am glad. If it was the Count that carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure this diary would have been a mystery to him which he would not have brooked. He would have taken it and destroyed it. As I look round the room, although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. May the 18th. I had been down to look at the room again in daylight, for I must know the truth. When I got to the doorway at the top of the stairs, I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door is fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream, and I must act on this surmise. May the 19th. I am surely in the toils. Last night the Count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done and that I should start for home within a few days, another that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter, and the third that I had left the castle and arrived at Bistritz. I would fain have rebelled but felt that in the present state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the Count whilst I am so absolutely in his power, and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and to arouse his anger. He knows that I know too much and that I must not live lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur which will give me a chance to escape. I saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which was manifest when he hurled the fair woman from me. He explained to me that posts were few and uncertain, and that my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends. And he assured me with so much impressiveness that he would countermand the later letters, which would be held over at the Stritz until due time, in case chance would admit of my prolonging my stay, that to oppose him would have been to create new suspicion. I therefore pretended to fall in with his views, and asked him what dates I should put on the letters. He calculated a minute, and then said, The first should be June the 12th, the second, June the 19th, and the third, June the 29th. I now know the span of my life. God help me. May the 28th. There is a chance of escape, or at any rate, of being able to send word home. A band of Zagani have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. These Zagani are gypsies. I have notes of them in my book. They are peculiar to this part of the world, though allied to the ordinary gypsies the world over. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves, as a rule, to some great noble or boyar, and call themselves by his name. They are fearless, without religion, save superstition, and they talk only their own varieties of the Romany tongue. I shall write some letters home, and shall try to get them to have them posted. I have already spoken to them through the window to begin an acquaintanceship. They took their hats off and made obeisance and many signs which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. 
I have written the letters. Nina's is in shorthand, and I simply ask Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her I have explained my situation, but without the horrors which I may only surmise. It would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, then the Count shall not yet know my secret or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters. I threw them through the bars of the window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart, bowed, then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back to my study and began to read. As the Count did not come in, I have written here. The Count has come. The Count sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters, The Zagani have given me these, of which, though I know not whence they came, I shall, of course, take care. See! He must have looked at it. One is from you, and to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other... Here he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the envelope, and the dark look came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed. Well, so it cannot matter to us and he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. Then he went on. The letter to Hawkins, that I shall of course send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow handed me a clean envelope. I could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence. Then he went out of the room. I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later I went over and tried it. The door was locked. When, an hour or two after, the Count came quietly into the room, his coming awakened me, for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing I had been sleeping, said, so, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight, since there are many labours to me. But you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room and went to bed, and, strange to say, slept without dreaming. Despair has its own calms. May the 31st. This morning when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket, so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again a surprise, again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my memoranda relating to railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact all that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. I sat and pondered a while, and then some thought occurred to me, and I made search of my portmanteau and in the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had travelled was gone, also my overcoat and rug. I could find no traces of them anywhere. This looked like some new scheme of villainy. June the 17th. This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgelling my brains, I heard without a cracking of whips and pounding and the scraping of horses' feet up the rocky path beyond the courtyard. With joy I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great litre wagons, each drawn by eight sturdy horses, and at the head of each pair a Slovak, with his wide hat, great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin and high boots. They had also their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall, as I thought that way might be open for them. Again a shock. My door was fastened on the outside. 
Then I ran to the window and cried to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed. Just then the hetman of the Sagani came out and seeing them pointing to my window said something at which they laughed. Henceforth no effort of mine, no piteous cry or agonized entreaty would make them even look at me. They resolutely turned away. The litre wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope. They were evidently empty by the ease with which the Slovaks handled them and by their resonance as they were roughly moved. When they were all unloaded and backed in a great heap in one corner of the yard, the Slovaks were given some money by the Zagani and spitting on it for good luck lazily went each to his horse's head. Shortly afterwards I heard the cracking of their whips die away in the distance. June the 24th, before morning. Last night the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out of the window which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there is something going on. The Zagani are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing work of some kind. I know it, for now and then I hear a far away muffled sound as of mattock and spade. And whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst travelling here and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too. This, then, is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my own letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall by the local people be attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, and whilst I am shut up here, a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law, which is even a criminal's right and consolation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice that there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of the moonlight. They were like the tiniest grains of dust, and they whirled round and gathered in clusters in a nebulous sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing, and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure in a more comfortable position, so that I could enjoy more fully the aerial gambling. Something made me start up. A low, piteous howling of dogs, somewhere far below in the valley, which was hidden from my sight. Louder it seemed to ring in my ears, and the floating motes of dust to take new shapes to the sound as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to awake to some call of my instincts. Nay, my very soul was struggling, and my half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker danced the dust, and the moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me into the mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered, till they seemed to take dim phantom shapes. And then I started, broad awake, and in full possession of my senses, and ran, screaming from the place. The phantom shapes, which were becoming gradually materialized from the moonbeams, were those of the three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled, and felt somewhat safer in my own room, where there was no moonlight, and where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail, quickly suppressed. Then there was silence, deep, awful silence, which chilled me. With a beating heart, I tried the door. But I was locked in my prison, and could do nothing. I sat down, and simply cried. As I sat, I heard a sound in the courtyard without, the agonized cry of a woman. 
I rushed to the window, and throwing it up, peered out between the bars. There indeed was a woman, with dishevelled hair, holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against a corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace, Monster, give me my child. She threw herself on her knees, and raising up her hands, cried the same words in tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair, beat her breast, and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally, she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere, high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before many minutes passed, a pack of them poured like pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance into the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long, they streamed away singly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thrall of night and gloom and fear? June the 25th, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and how dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night, one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it. Action! It has always been at night time that I have been molested or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake? That he may be awake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room! But there is no possible way. The door is always locked. No way for me. Yes, there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body has gone, why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should I not imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst it can only be death, and a man's death is not a calf's, and the dread hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina, if I fail. Goodbye, my faithful friend and second father. Goodbye, all. And last of all, Mina. Same day later. I have made the effort, and, God helping me, have come safely back to this room. I must put down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh straight to the window on the south side and at once got outside on the narrow edge of stone which runs round the building on this side. The stones were big and roughly cut, and the mortar had by process of time been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down once, so as to make sure that sudden glimpse of the awful depth would not overcome me, but after that kept my eyes away from it. I knew pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window, and made for it as well as I could, having regard to the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy, I suppose I was too excited, 
and the time seemed ridiculously short till I found myself standing on the window sill and trying to raise up the sash. I was filled with agitation, however, when I bent down and slid feet foremost through the window. Then I looked round for the Count, but with surprise and gladness made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms and was covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock and I could not find it anywhere. The only thing I found was a great heap of gold in one corner. Gold of all kinds, Roman and British, Austrian, Hungarian, Greek and Turkish money, covered with a film of dust as though it had lain long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than three hundred years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jewelled, but all of them old and stained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried it, for since I could not find the key of the room or the key of the outer door, which was the main object of my search, I must make further examination, or all my efforts would be in vain. It was open and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. I descended, minding carefully where I went, for the stairs were dark, being only lit by loopholes in the heavy masonry. At the bottom there was a dark, tunnel-like passage, through which came a deathly, sickly odour, the odour of old earth newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer and heavier. At last I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar and found myself in an old ruined chapel which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken and in two places were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had recently been dug over and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovaks. There was nobody about and I made search for any further outlet, but there were none. Then I went over every inch of the ground, so as not to lose a chance. I went down even into the vaults, where the dim light struggled, although to do so was dread to my very soul. Into two of these I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep, I could not say which, for the eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death, and the cheeks had the warmth of life through all their pallor, and the lips red as ever. But there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over him, and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. He could not have lain there long, for the earthy smell would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have the keys on him, but when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate, though unconscious of me or my presence, that I fled from the place and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled again up the castle wall. Regaining my own chamber, I threw myself panting upon the bed, and tried to think. June the 29th Today is the date of my last letter and the Count has taken steps to prove that it was genuine, for again I saw him leave the castle by the same window and in my clothes. As he went down the wall, lizard fashion, I wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon that I might destroy him. But I fear that no weapon wrought alone by man's hand would have any effect on him. I dared not wait to see him return, for I feared to see the weird sisters I came back to the library and read there till I fell asleep. I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me grimly, as a man can look, as he said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. 
you return to your beautiful England, I to some work, which may have such an end that we may never meet. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the Zagani, who have some labours of their own here, and also come some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you, and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistritz. But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. I suspected him, and determined to test his sincerity. Sincerity? It seemed like a profanation of the word to write it in connection with such a monster. So I asked him, point blank, Why may I not go tonight? Because, my dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled such a soft, smooth, diabolical smile that I knew there was some trick behind his smoothness. He said, And your baggage? I do not care about it. I can send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said with a sweet courtesy which made me rub my eyes, it seemed so real, You English have a saying which is so close to my heart, for its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will, though sad I am at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. With a stately gravity, he with the lamp preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark. Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the raising of his hand, just as the music of a great orchestra seems to leap under the baton of the conductor. After a pause of a moment, he proceeded in his stately way to the door, drew back the ponderous bolts, unhooked the heavy chains, and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked all round, but could see no key of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without grew louder and angrier. Their red jaws with champing teeth and their blunt-clawed feet as they leapt came in through the opening door. I knew that a struggle at the moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these at his command, I could do nothing. But still the door continued slowly to open, and only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly it struck me that this might be the moment and the means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea great enough for the Count. And as a last chance I cried out, Shut the door! I shall wait till morning and covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut, and the great bolts clanged and echoed throughout the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence we returned to the library, and after a minute or two I went to my own room. The last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me, with a red light of triumph in his eyes, and with a smile that Judas in hell might be proud of. When I was in my room, and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly, and listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back, back to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. 
I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. Is it then so near the end? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Lord, help me, and those to whom I am dear. June the 30th, morning. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn, and when I awoke, I threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came, he should find me ready. At last, I felt that subtle change in the air, and knew that the morning had come. Then came the welcome cockcrow, and I felt I was safe. With a glad heart, I opened my door and ran down the hall. I had seen that the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness, I unhooked the chains and drew back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despair seized me. I pulled and pulled and pulled at the door, and shook it till, massive as it was, it rattled in its casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the count. Then a wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk, and I determined then and there to scale the wall again and gain the count's room. He might kill me, but death now seemed the happier choice of evils. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and scrambled down the wall as before into the count's room. It was empty, but that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heap of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner and down the winding stair and along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough where to find the monster I sought. The great box was in the same place, close against the wall, but the lid was on it, not fastened down, but with the nails ready in their places to be hammered home. I knew I must search the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall. Then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed, for the white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron grey. The cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. Even the deep burning eyes seemed set among swollen flesh, for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature was simply gorged with blood. It lay like a filthy leech, exhausted with his repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense in me revolted at the contact. But I had to search, or I was lost. The coming night might see my own body a banquet in a similar way to those horrid three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. Then I stopped and looked at the Count. There was a mocking smile on his bloated face, which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being I was helping to transfer to London, where perhaps for centuries to come he might, among its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever-widening circle of semi-demons to batten on the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand, but I seized a shovel which the workmen had been using to fill the cases, and lifting it high, struck with the edge downwards at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned, and the eyes fell full upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled it away, the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight. 
The last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I thought and thought what should be my next move, but my brain seemed on fire, and I waited with a despairing feeling growing over me. As I waited, I heard in the distance a gypsy song sung by merry voices coming closer, and through their song the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. The Zagani and the Slovaks, of whom the Count had spoken, were coming. With a last look round and at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and gained the Count's room, determined to rush out the moment the door should be opened. With strained ears, I listened and heard downstairs the grinding of the key in the great lock and the falling back of the heavy door. There must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for one of the locked doors. Then there came the sound of many feet tramping and dying away in some passage which sent up a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, where I might find the new entrance. But at that moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to with a shock that sent the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner, and the net of doom was closing round me more closely. As I write, there is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet and the crash of weights being set down heavily, doubtlessly the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering. It is the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet tramping along the hall and many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut and the chains rattle there is the grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdrawn. Then another door opens and shuts. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. Hark! In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of the whips, the chorus of the Zagani as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those awful women. Ah, Mina is a woman, and there is naught in common. They are devils at the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall further than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I may yet find a way from this dreadful place. Then, away for home. Away to the quickest and nearest train. Away from this cursed spot, from this cursed land, where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than that of these monsters, and the precipice is steep and high. At its foot, man may sleep as a man. Goodbye, all. Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra. May the ninth, My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you and by the sea, where we can walk together freely and build our castles in the air. I have been working very hard lately because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies, and I have been practicing shorthand very assiduously. When we are married, I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which I am also practicing very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you, I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day, if there is anything in it worth sharing, but it is really an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists do, interviewing, writing descriptions, and trying to remember conversations. 
I am told that with a little practice one can remember all that goes on or that one hears during the day. However, we shall see. I shall tell you all my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye. Your loving Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You've not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumours, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mamma get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man who would do just for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent party, being handsome, well off, and of good birth. He is a doctor, and really clever. Just fancy. He is only nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he calls here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tried this on very much with me, but I flatter myself he has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study, and gives you more trouble than you can fancy if you've never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There. It is all out. Nina, we have told our secrets to each other ever since we were children. We have slept together and eaten together and laughed and cried together. And now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him, I love him, I love him. There, that does me good. I wish I were with you, dear, sitting by the fire undressing as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop, or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop, for I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers. And Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. L. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray, May the 24th. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains, but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, 
who will be 20 in September, and yet I never had a proposal till today, and not a real proposal, and today I have had three. Just fancy, three proposals in one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three proposals. But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls, or they will be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas, and imagining themselves injured and slighted if in their very first day at home they did not get six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina, dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you all about the three, but you must keep it a secret, dear, from everyone except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, of course, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything. Don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him. Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man, with a strong jaw and the good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself to all sorts of little things, and remembered them, but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. Then, when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry, he said that he was a brute, and he would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off, and asked me if I could love him in time. And when I shook my head, his hands trembled, and then with some hesitation, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have some hope. Then, Mina, I felt it a sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. I only told him that much. Then he stood up, looked very strong and very grave as he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if ever I wanted a friend, I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice and all that sort of thing, but it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow whom you know loves you honestly going away and looking all broken-hearted, and to know that, no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing quite out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off. So I can go on telling you all about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He is such a nice fellow. An American from Texas, and he looks so young and so fresh that it seems almost impossible that he's been to so many places and has had so many adventures. I sympathize with poor Desdemona when she had such a dangerous stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think that a man will save us from fears, and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man, and wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't. For there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any. And yet, my dear, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't. For Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I helping him all I could. I am not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, he never does so to strangers or before them, for he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out 
that it amused me to hear him talk American slang. And whenever I was present, and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I am afraid, my dear, that he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it, as I have never heard him use any as yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me and looked as happy and as jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his and said ever so sweetly, Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixing of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me? Let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness. Well, he did look so good-humoured and so jolly that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said, as lightly as I could, that I did not know anything of hitching and that I wasn't broken to harness as yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so on so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a bit serious too. I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt, though I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. Then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it, that I shall never again think that a man must be always playful, and never earnest, because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped. Lucy, you are an honest, hardy girl, I know that. I should not be here speaking to you as I am now, if I did not believe you clean grit right through to the very depths of your soul. You tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breath again, and will be, if you'll let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears. I'm afraid, my dear, you will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one. I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men, or as many as want her, and save all the trouble? Oh, but this is heresy. I must not say it. I am glad to say that, though I was crying, I was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes, and I told him straight, Yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, Mina, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine, I think I put them into his, and said in a hearty way, that's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I'll take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he'd better look for it soon cause he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish anyhow. My dear, I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and kingdom come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like. For the other good fellow, and he must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow, or you could not love him, hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Mina. For it was brave and sweet of him, and noble too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he so sad. So I leant over, 
and I kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I am afraid I was blushing very much, he said, Little girl, I hold your hand, and you've kissed me. And if these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear or a quiver or a pause, and I, crying like a baby. Oh, why must a man like that be made unhappy, when there are lots of girls in the world who would worship the very ground he trod on? I know I would, if only I were free. Only I don't want to be free. Oh, my dear, this quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of number three till it can be happy. Ever your loving, Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I needn't tell you all about number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both of his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to the Lord for all his goodness to me in sending me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary, kept in phonograph. April the 25th. Ebb tide in appetite today. Cannot eat, cannot rest. So diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went down among the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint in his ideas, and so unlike the normal lunatic, that I have determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seemed to wish to keep him to the point of his lunacy, his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patients, as I would the mouth of hell. Memo. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? R. M. Renfield, Aetat, 59. Sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable. Periods of gloom ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man. Probably dangerous, if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armour for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident or a series of accidents can balance it. Letter, Quincy P. Morris to Honourable Arthur Holmwood, 25th of May, My dear Art, We've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas. We've drunk health at the shore of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I've no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There'll only be one other, our old pal of the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup, and to drink the health 
with all our hearts to the happiest man in the wide world who's won the noblest heart that God has made and the best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome, a loving greeting, and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours as ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris. May the 26th. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. Mina Murray's Journal, Whitby, July the 24th. Lucy met me at the station looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house of the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, to the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up one over the other like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin, of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen at one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard all full of tombstones. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbour and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour that part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them through the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end too has a lighthouse. Between the two piers there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high tide. But when the tide is out, it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk running between the banks of sand with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side, there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp edge of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy with a bell, which swings in bad weather, and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here, that when a ship is lost, Bells are heard at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man. He must be awfully old, for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very sceptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said very brusquely, I wouldn't fash myself about them, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mind, I don't say they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them ordinary folk from York and Leeds, oh, I be always eating, cured herring, drinking tea, looking out to buy cheap jet with creed or <laughs> I want a masser who be bothered ten lies to em. 
even newspapers, which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up and said, Ah, I must go to Geewood's home now, miss. My granddaughter don't like me kept waiting when tea's ready. For it take me time to cram a boon the grease, for there be many of them. And, miss, I lack food, silly by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature of the place. They lead from the town up to the church, and there are hundreds of them, I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother. They were only duty calls, though, and I did not go. They will be home by this. August the 1st. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue, then he bullies them, and then takes their silence for agreement. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when she sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me a double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it and put it down. It be all fool talk, lock, stock, barrel, as we be, no else. These bangs and wafts and bogles and bargess and bogles and all ent is only fit set bands and dizzy women a belder in. There be nobody a blibs. They and all grims and signs and warnings. They be all invented by parsons, and ill-some butte bodies, railway touters to skeer and scun a halfling, and to get folks to do something they don't other incline to. Ah, oh, it make me I have all think of them. Why, it's them that not content with printing lies on paper, and preaching them out of pulpits, does want to be cutting them on tombstones. You look here all round you, in what air you will. All them steens, holding up their heads as well as they can out their pride, is cat. Simply tumbling down with a weight of lies on them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them. And yet, in night half of them, there be no bodies at all and the memories of them ain't care to pinch a snuff about much this sacred. Lies, all of them, nothing but lies, one kind another. Oh, my God, it'll be a square scoutment day of judgment when they come tumbling up here in their death sharks, all drooped together, trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they were. Some of them trembling and dithering, their hands that dozened and slippery from lying in the sea. They can't even keep their grub at them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air that the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies, he was showing off now. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yeah, blins. There may be poorish few not wrong, uh, saving where they make out people too good. For there be folk that do think a barn bowl be like their sea, if only it be their own. The old thing be only lies. Now you look here. You you come here, stranger. You see this Kirk Gough? I nodded, 
for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on. And you can say that all these things be boon folk that be out in the air. Snoon grog, eh? I assented again. Then that be just where the lie come in. Why, there be scores of these lay beds that be tomb as old Dun's back a box on Friday night. <coughs> he nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. And oh my God, how could they be otherwise? You look at that one. The artist bar, the beer bank. You read it. I went over and read. Edward Spencer they, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April 1854, age 30. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Oh, boy, him home. I wanted to have him here, eh? Murdered off the coast of Andres, and you can say that his body lay under. Why, I could name you a dozen whose bones lay in the Greenland seas above. He pointed northwards. Oh, where the currents may have drifted them. They be the steens around ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. Ah, this Braithwaite Lowry. Now, I knew his father, last in the lively off Greenland in twenty. Or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas, 1777. Or John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later. Or old John Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me. He drowned in the Gulf of Finland in 50. Do you think all these men have to make a rush to Whitby when trumpets sound? I have me anthrums booted, eh? I tell ye that when they got here, they be jumbling and jostling one another that way. They be like fighting up the ice in the old days, when we be one another from daylight to dark, trying to type up cuts by the light the aurora borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man crackled over it, and the cronies joined in with gusto. But, I said, surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all the poor people, or their spirits will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will really be necessary? Well, what else be they tombstone for? You are to me that, miss. Uh, to please their relatives, I suppose, I said. To please their relatives, you suppose? This he said with intense scorn. How will it pleasure their relatives? to know that lies is wrote over them, and that everybody in the place know where they be lies. He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was then rested, and it was close to the edge of the cliff. You read the lines on that, Thufstin, he said. The letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read, Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection on June the 29th, 1873, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb is erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Well, really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see all fully. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Ask cause ye don't go on the soy mother was a hell cat that hated him because he was a crook. Oh, a regular lamentary he was. And he hated her so that he committed suicide order that she might get insurance she put on in his life. He blew night top off his head with an old musket that they had scared the crows with. Twelve for crows then, for it brought the clegs and the doubts to him. And that's the way he fell off rocks. And, as he hopes a glorious resurrection, I've often heard him say that he'd hope to go to well, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he don't want all to do where she was. Now, in that steen at any rate? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. Ah, 
pack of lies. Won't it make Gabriel kickle when Geordie comes panting up the grease with the tombstone balanced on his ump and ask it to be took as evidence? I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up, Oh, why did you tell us of this? It is my favourite seat and I cannot leave it. And now I find I must go on sitting over the grave of a suicide. Thou wilt arm ye me pretty, and it may make poor Jory gladsome have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye. Why, I've sat here on off nigh twenty year past, and done me no harm. Though ye fash about them as lies under ye, or that doesn't lie either. It'll be time for ye to be getting scar when you see tombstones all run away with, places bare as stubble field. Ah, there's clock. I'm as gone. My service to your ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat. And she told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day, I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left, the view is cut off by the black line of roofs of the old houses next to the abbey. The sheep and the lambs are bleating in the fields behind me, and there is a clatter of donkey's hooves up the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time, and further along the quay, there is the Salvation Army meeting in the back streets. Neither of the bands hears the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary June the 5th the case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not yet know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment he did not break into a fury as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course I said that would do. June the 18th. He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting the flies from outside to his room. July the 1st. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated with carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it exultingly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, he put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, 
that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiments of one. I must watch how he gets rid of the spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting something down. Whole pages are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches, then the totals added in batches again, as though he was... he was focusing some account, as the auditors put it. July the 8th. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh, unconscious celebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remained as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming it is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. July the 19th. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favour, a very, very great favour, and as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice little sleek playful kitten that I can play with, teach, and feed, and feed, and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity, but I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word and sat gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning early. July 20th. Visited Renfield very early before the attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar which he had saved in the window and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again and beginning cheerfully and with good grace. I looked around for his birds and not seeing them asked him where they were. He replied without turning round that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there was anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to see me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds, that he just took and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete. My theory proved. 
My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him and call him Azufagos, life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done, if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect? The knowledge of the brain. Had I even the secret of one such mind? Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one such lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing if only there were a sufficient cause. I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain, congenitally? How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do, within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work, work. If only I could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend, a good, unselfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's Journal, July the 26th. I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time and there is also something about the shorthand symbols that make it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time and was very concerned. But yesterday, dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then too Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our rooms every night. Mrs. Westenra has an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on the roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs then get suddenly awakened and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear, she is naturally anxious about Lucy, and she tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would get up in the night, dress himself, and go out, if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning her dresses and how the house is to be arranged. I do sympathize with her, for I do the same, only Jonathan and I will start life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Holmwood, he is the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, the only son of Lord Godalming, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat on the churchyard cliff, and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. July the 27th. No news from Jonathan. 
I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should I do not know. But I do wish he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am wakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot she cannot get cold. But still the anxiety, and the perpetually being awakened, is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost that anemic look which she had, and I pray it will last. August the 3rd. Another week gone, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, and yet it is his writing, there is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. August the 6th. Another three days, and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If only I knew where to write to, or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it, and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun as I write is hidden in the thick clouds high over Kettleness. Everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Grey, earthy rock. Grey clouds, tinged with sunburst at the far edge, hang over the grey sea, into which the sand points stretch like grey fingers. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats, with a roar, muffled in the sea mists, drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist, and all is vastness. The clouds piling up like giant rocks, and there is a brool over the sea that sounds like some passage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home, and rise and dip in the groundswell as they sweep into the harbour, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine, and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, I'm afraid, my dear, I must have shot you by all the wicked things I've been saying about dead and such like past weeks. But I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I've gone. We old folks to be daffled and with one foot abaft the crawl hole don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scared of it. And that's why I took to making light of it, so that I cheer up me own heart a bit. Oh, but Lord love ye, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit. Only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand now, for I be old. And a hundred years is too much for any man to expect. And I'm so naughty that the old man is already wetting his scythe. You see, my dear, I can't get out of the habit of caffing about it all at once. Oh, the chaps will wag as they used to. Some day soon, Angel of Death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye duel and greet me, dearie. For he now saw that I was crying, 
If he shall come this very night, I not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waiting for something else than what we are doing, and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I am content, for it's coming to me, my dearie, and coming quick. It may be coming while we be looking and wondering. Maybe it's in that wind out there over the sea that's bringing with it loss, wreck, sore distress, and sad hearts. Look, look, he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind, and in the old beyond that sounds. It looks, tastes, and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. Oh, Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, blessed me, said goodbye, and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the coast guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me as he always does, but all the time he was looking at a strange ship. Ah, I can't make her out," he said. "She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit." She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put in here. Look there again. Ooh, she steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel. Changes about with every puff of wind. Mm. We'll hear more of her before this. Cutting from the Daily Telegraph, the eighth of August, which I have pasted into my journal. Whitby, one of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as ever was known, and the great body of holiday makers set out yesterday for their visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rigmill, Runswick, Staithes, and the various trips in the neighbourhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made excursions along the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the Eastcliff churchyard, and from that commanding eminence watch the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and the east, called attention to a sudden show of mares' tails high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree, which is barometrical language and ranked number two light breeze. The coast guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman who, for more than half a century, has kept watch on the weather signs from the east cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful. So grand in its masses of splendidly coloured clouds that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset colour: flame purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses not large but seemingly of absolute blackness. In all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes, the experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the Prelude to the Great Storm will grace the R.A. and the R.I. walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble or his mule, as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbour till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening. And at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, 
for even the coasting steamers, which usually hug the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sail set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment while she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of the danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before ten o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleating of a sheep in land or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier, with its lively French air, was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which at the time seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realise, the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White-crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up their shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept the lanterns of the lighthouses which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbour. The wind roared like thunder, and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet, or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire pier from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have been increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds, which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold, that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death. And many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. At times, the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which now came thick and fast, followed by such sudden peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high, through skywards with each wave, mighty masses of white foam which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat with a rag of sail running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of the inrushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing boat with gunwale under water rushed into the harbour, able by the guidance of the sheltering light to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on shore a shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale, but then was swept away in the rush. Before long the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sail set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realised the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and with the wind blowing from its present quarter it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbour. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner with all sails set was rushing with such speed 
that in the words of one old sort, she must fetch up somewhere, if it was only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog, greater than any hitherto known. A mass of dank mist, which seemed to close on all things like a grey pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing, for the roar of the tempest and the crash of the thunder, together with the booming of the mighty bellows, came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbour mouth across the east pier where the shock was expected, and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast. Then, miracle of miracle, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast with all sail set and gained the safety of the harbour. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse, with drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. A great awe came on us all, as we realised that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbour unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbour, pitched herself on the accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier jutting out under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up the sand heap. Every spar, rope and stay was strained, and some of the top hamper came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if shot up by the concussion, and running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thrustines, or through stones, as they call them in the Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away, the dog disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus the coast guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbour, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb on board. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance to the harbour without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The coast guard ran aft, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it and recoiled at once, as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique the general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It is a good way round from the West Cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, but your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd whom the Coast Guard and the police had refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on the deck, and was one of the small group who saw that the dead seaman was actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised, or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both his wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin, of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared after making examination that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle carefully corked, 
empty save for a little roll of paper which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said that the man must have tied his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on in the Admiralty Court. For the Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the rights of the first civilian entering a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statutes of Mortman, since the tiller, as emblemship, if not proof of delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he has held his honourable watch, a steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. The crowds are scattering homewards, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire worlds. I shall send, in time for your next issue, Further details of the derelict ship, which has found her way so miraculously into the harbour in the storm. Whitby, August the 9th. The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand, with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mould. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington of Seven the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbour dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days wonder, they are evidently determined there shall be no cause of after complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way to the moors where it is still hiding in terror. There are those who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later it should itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning, a large dog, a half-bred mastiff, belonging to a coal merchant close to Tate Pier Hill, was found dead in the roadway opposite the master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away, and its belly slid open, as if with a savage claw. Later. By the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to facts of missing men. The greater interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle which was today produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold it has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he had got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me.